Welcome everybody, this is Ryan from Midnight and this is part three of the local application video series. Um, part one went over the general basics of how to actually get it open, uh, what all the gauges do, you know, the, the status panel that you're looking at now. Part two went over the data logging and graphing and exportation of data from the local app. Part three and possibly four are going to be on the configuration tab which allows you to do all the programming of the classic. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drag that out because I want to actually go over every, every little detail of that and also explain to you why you might want to change those values, not just explain to you what the value is, but why you might change it. So uh, I'm going to try to keep the video maybe around eight, seven or eight minutes, so if I'm going long I'm going to break it into part four. So we will look for that and uh, go from there. Again, assuming you already have watched part one and you know how to get to this stage from the minimize stage here, um, we will go back to that and we will go from there. Uh, first thing we're going to do then is click on the config tab, which is going to take us to the settings page. So essentially when you click on any one of these tabs up here, you're going to get sub-tabs down here, sub subcategories. In this case, the settings tab is where we go first. And this is where you would pick your monitor color. You can change the color of the monitor. Uh, you would click on that and pull down something out of that drop-down that you prefer. It defaults to the screen. I'm going to leave it there. This is where you would set it to check for updates. In this case, you see mine is set to check daily for updated firmware and if there was new firmware you could uh, it would ask you and ask you if you want to update or you could check it now by clicking this and it's going to say no update available because I have it set to auto check. Uh, there's another auto detect classic box here which is also up, up in that applications tab up here that we showed in video one. This lets the local app listen for the broadcast so every classic that's on your network in your house is sending out a little broadcast every 30 seconds over your network uh, letting the local application know, hey, I'm here. So when you open the local application, it starts listening for that broadcast on your network, and it says, oh, look, I found the classic, and they open up. Um, you can you can disable that if there was a case where you wanted to watch just one classic and you didn't want the other ones being detected because you want to see them on something else, um, or, or some case like that. But by default, that would be checked and allow you to auto you know auto see those. The next checkbox is to enable the data logging. We talked about that in uh, the data video, video 2. Uh, but if that's checked, the local app is actually saving uh, data five times a second, every two tenths of a second, to the computer's hard drive. And you can go back and look at that at any time. It's only saving it while it's actually running. The next field is the unlock code. And you'll notice a lot of these things, if you mouse over them, they'll tell you what they do. Um, the unlock code allows this local application to actually make changes to the programming. If you don't enter that code and click the little submit button here, then you won't be able to make the changes. The next, All the next three tabs we're going to talk about will be grayed out. And that's basically a safety feature. So if you wanted to allow uh, a little bit of public access where you may have a computer at work and you want other people to be able to see what's going on with your classic, you can not give them the unlock code and they can't make changes. The unlock code here is actually the serial number of the classic. You leave off the CL and it's the actual numerical portion of the uh, serial number. You would enter that in there and click submit and that will unlock everything. The next function here is export and import registers and uh, basically what that is is settings. So if you were an installer and you always use the same batteries you could have a, uh, a register file that you could import by clicking here and, and bringing it in off the computer and that would save you from entering all those values one by one or if you had to do an RMA for whatever reason you could export the registers from the old controller and once the new one is installed you could import the new registers so it's a easy way to back up the controller and you know reset it back to where it was you know to the same way uh, by simply importing and exporting versus having to go through all these next tabs like you're gonna see <coughs> excuse me uh, so the basic tab again is the first tab in configuration so once we've unlocked it we would click the basic tab and here's where we would do basically the basic settings we can name the classic 
as you can see here it's named house 3.8 you can see that name up here this will actually also show up on the MNGP the display of the classic so if you've got three or four classics it's, it can be very handy to name them something besides just classic because when you open this you're gonna see four controllers that say classic and you've got to try to figure out which one's which so to do that you would just name it like uh, name me and you would click this little purple button over here these little buttons are in every category and that's a basically a write button or a commit button and that's now just sent that to the classic and change its name and if I was to go look at the display on the classic it would now say name me um, so that's basically just like it says just the name it is limited to I believe seven characters um, so have fun with that and it gives you a chance to personalize your controller the next one is the tracking mode, MPPT, Maximum PowerPoint Tracking Mode. The Classic is fairly unique compared to a lot of other controllers in that it has a software on and off. This basically will put it into resting mode if I click off and open the relay and stop it from doing anything. Um, because it does so many different varieties of DC inputs, this was kind of a needed function. So if you're trying to do some testing on a hydro or something like that, you can actually turn this off and it won't charge. It will just stay in the off state on the relay and allow you to do what you got to do. And then you'd go back and put it on and, and save that value. Um, the other thing over here is you can change between all the tracking modes, micro hydro, legacy P&O, solar, wind track, dynamic, and use set. Uh, and what those mean, uh, just like they say, micro hydro is for, you know, uh, the water hydro turbines that go in the river. Um, could be a uh, run of the river or it could be, you know, one of a, a large head. Um, but again, it's, it's uh, just for the water style turbines. Uh, Legacy P&O is basically a solar tracking algorithm, but it's a very slow tracking, uh, similar to what was done on the Outback F MX-60 when we did that. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it does it a lot slower, so if you've got something that's a little harder to track, or if you've got some mix-matched PV that might have two different MPPD points, but they're fairly close, you may put it in Legacy P&O just so that it doesn't um, get confused. Solar mode is the default solar tracking. It does a full sweep in about a tenth of a second. Um, that works great, like I said, unless you've got uh, a mixed match of panels in two different MPPT voltages. Uh, and what I mean by that, without going too far down the, the road, is that uh, the solar module itself has an MPPT voltage. Uh, a typical 60 cell module will be around 30 volts. So if you had a 60 cell module at 30 volts and then you had another string that had a 72 cell module that was running around 40 volts MPPT, you would see you have two different multi-power points on that array. And in solar mode, it's probably just going to pick the first one it finds, even though that might not be the most productive one, because you know it's not expecting to have two different power points in that array. So in that case, you know you really wouldn't want to wire the array that way. But if it was, then legacy P&O would work well. Um, wind track is just what it says. It's uh, for the wind. <coughs> Excuse me. It's for tracking wind turbines. Um, basically, it's a manual tracking system where you would, when you select wind track, you would then go to the tech tab and you would uh, you would build a wind curve. Uh, it's going to be 16 points, and we will talk about that in the uh, in part four, possibly even part five, depending on how long these videos go. Uh, dynamic is very similar to solar, but it's um, kind of really on the fly. So solar mode is looking for a uh, 10% change in power, or every three minutes it will do a full sweep on the array. So if the array changes 5%, it's going to you know wait for that three minute interval. Dynamic tries to actually track that on the fly and always be changing and looking for that new power point. Um, sometimes dynamic can make a little bit more power, sometimes solar mode can make a little bit more power. Uh, most people don't bother with dynamic because it's not really um, that beneficial, but it is in there if you want to play with it. And you set VOC is just what it says. It's uh, it can be useful for things like um, different types of hydro or different types of DC inputs, but basically what it does it allows you to pick a percentage of the open circuit voltage and it'll park there and just stay there. Um, you can tell it how often you want it to sweep and look for a new open circuit voltage. 
uh, but then it's just going to park there. So it's it's really kind of handy for troubleshooting. If you've got a uh, PV array and the controller keeps going to resting and not making any power and the sun's out and you're like, what is going on? Um, you know, it seems like I might have a bad connection somewhere, but I can't seem to find it. You can put it like in use set VOC at 75% or 80%, and it will park there and try to, you know, try to make power out of that array and allow you to then, you know, kind of see, okay, if it's still not making any power, it's obviously a bad connection somewhere, I can go find it. Um, so it's, it's kind of a troubleshooting feature more than anything. Again, after you made your changes, you would click this button here. If the controller is charging like it is right now, and we switched it to legacy PO and save it, this is kind of a fail safe. It's a little misleading though. You'll notice it went to zero. Uh, the controller just changed to legacy PO. It is not going to come back on because the status is actually off. It doesn't show that here, but it's actually off. Anytime you make an abrupt change in the MPPT mode while it's actually charging, it turns this mode off to save doing any damage to anything. So then we'd have to go back and turn that mode on and save it. And now you're going to notice the needle here will pop up in just a second when the relay clicks. There you go. So that's kind of a safety feature, and it's kind of a little misleading um, bug in the local app that will, will not tell you that it's still off. So if you just switched it like that and went away, you're going to come home and, and, and uh, be a little upset with me because it's still in the off state. So just select on, save it, and there you go. Uh, moving down, battery voltage. This is the nominal voltage of the controller, what it's connected to for a battery bank. In my case, my battery voltage is 48. You typically wouldn't change this when the controller is running because, well, you didn't change the battery voltage. But if you're using this to program the controller, so you got a classic light or you just don't like using the display and you decide you're going to a 24 volt battery you can select that here and save that down at the bottom of this category but again something you wouldn't normally change on the fly absorb voltage this is the target voltage is trying to charge to sometimes referred to as bulk um, absorb is a regulated state bulk is not so what happens is in a three-stage charging you're going to start out in bulk, putting as much current as you possibly can in the battery to try to hit this target voltage right here. And when you hit that voltage, you're going to maintain that voltage and regulate the current for a period of time, and then you'll drop into float. Now that time is over here, and by default that's two hours. Um, you really want to check with your battery manufacturer on all these settings here. They're going to tell you how to calculate this time. They're going to tell you what these voltages are. You would set them in here and save it a little farther down here. <coughs> Excuse me. And properly charge your battery. That's very important to get those values from your battery manufacturer. Um, this button here will force a bulk charge. So if you're in float and want to force another bulk state, you can click this button and it will go back into bulk and, and go to absorb and do another whole charge. And then down here we get into equalize. We have the equalize voltage, which again your battery manufacturer will get you. We have a start and a stop equalize button here, so if we want to do a manual equalization we can do that here. We have the duration of the equalize charge, which in this case is set for an hour. Again, that's the value that the battery manufacturer supplies you. Um, it can be anywhere from an hour to three or four hours. You really want to check with them because that, if it's set too long, can do damage, and if it's set too short, will not properly equalize your battery. Uh, auto equalize, we can set that, and then we can program it when we want it to equalize. We can go every 30 days, and the uh, one unique thing on the classic is the retry days. So what you have here, the interval, is how often it's going to do an equalize charge. What you have over here is how many days in a row it's going to try. So as it's set right now, every 30 days it's going to try to equalize my battery. If there's not enough sun on the first day, it's going to try again on day two. And if there's not enough sun, it's going to try again on day three. And then if there's still not enough sun, it's just going to give up and try again in 30 days. So this allows you to, you know, kind of tailor that custom for you. A lot of people don't like to have it um, trying to equalize, you know, forever because it could get part way there and not actually get all the way there and just be using a lot of water and if it's unattended or whatever you could boil the batteries dry so that's why we put the retry days in again talk to your battery manufacturer on how often to equalize it and you know the retry days that's that's information they would want to give you um, the next box down is float volts 
Again, this is a, a value the battery manufacturer give you. I, and I hate to keep preaching on that, but it's 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 really really critical. So every battery is a little bit different. Every manufacturer and every chemistry is different. And if you just leave these at defaults, chances are very good you're going to undercharge your battery and destroy it very very quickly. If you set it too high, you're going to boil your battery and probably destroy it very, very quickly. So again, you really want to make sure you get all these values from your battery manufacturer, set them properly, and you know save them. And that's going to give you the longest life out of that battery you can get. Um, the force button here is just like the absorb one up above. If you're in absorb and you want you want to exit the absorb prematurely, you can click this force button and that will force it into float and uh, drop it out of absorb. And after you've made all your changes, again the little commit button here will let you save all that data to the actual classic. The next one is LED mode. So if you're in front of the classic you're going to notice there's three LEDs on the left hand side of the display and there's three LEDs on the top of the circuit board looking in through the vents. And those LEDs have the ability to tell us different things. Uh, different modes tells us, you know, does different things with those LEDs. We can select off, which will mean there'll just never be an LED on period no matter what, even if the controller has a fatal error or anything. We can select RIC mode, which basically allows us to only display an LED during some kind of, you know, critical error and nothing else. We can select blinky mode, which just randomly blinks all of them in a, in a random pattern. Uh, more of a test function for the LEDs, but everybody liked it, uh, so we left it in there. It was kind of a disco mode, I guess you'd call it. LED1 is the default mode that it ships in, and probably the most common one everybody uses. This is going to give you errors, warnings, and status. So you're going to see, like on the left-hand side of the display, a green LED for... Uh, float, uh, orange LED for current limit. If you look in through the grill of the vent, you're going to see uh, the left LED for auxiliary 1, the right LED for auxiliary 2, and the middle LED is going to blink for follow me. So this is this is just kind of a nice um, at a glance what's going on with my uh, with my classic LED mode. Com test is just like it said. If you put it in com test, you're going to get a, a, a red LED that blinks on the display once a second, letting you know that it is talking to the actual controller. Uh, more of a internal troubleshooting, if you will. And net test is the same way. You're going to get a little blink every time there's a network traffic pat packet that goes in or out of the controller. Um, again, LED one probably the most common. And after you've selected your LED mode, again save it to the classic. Uh, bully menu. Um, this is basically to reboot the controller. So anytime you make changes like the uh, networking or the arc fault in the advanced tabs, which we'll talk about later, you have to reboot the controller to make those take effect. Uh, all the basic charging parameters take effect immediately, but anything to do with arc fault or networking, those parameters are only loaded on boot up. So there's, there's the ability to reboot from, the, from here basically after you make those changes. And the next box is the time sink. Um, one thing I really want to point out here, <coughs> excuse me, is that the classic itself has the display, and the display has the battery and the clock on it. So if you are using the display and you go to and set the time here, it's not going to hold because the display of the classic actually has priority and overwrites the time because that's where the battery is. If you want to use this to program the time instead of the display, you have to go into the tweaks menu on the classic itself and look for the function called time sync and turn it off, just like it says here. And now we can use this to set the time. We can either set the time and date manually, you know, by selecting the, the, the day and the month and the year and the time, or we can actually sync it to the PC. So if the PC is in the same time zone, we can click this button and you're going to see my screen's going to turn green here because now it's happy and the time is no longer off because I just set it after the daylight savings change. And if you set it manually, you'd click this button. So if you use these three fields, you'd click this button and save it. If you want to sync it to the computer, all you have to do is click sync. Uh, so there, there you go. That's a rundown of the basic tab and what these things mean. We're 19 minutes into this video, so we've gone a lot longer than I anticipated. So I'm going to say now there's going to be a part four, which is advanced, and a part five, which is tech. 
So please come back and watch uh, the other two parts to these videos. And again, uh, if there's any questions on the data logging or the, the basic functions of the classic, the status tab is video one, the data tab is video two, and we will see you in video four. Thank you.